morning, everyone, and welcome to the 102nd episode of the Veritas Fact Finding Series. And this morning, I'm joined by Mr. Armand Cabasholto. Good morning, Armand. Anthony, very nice to be here. Welcome. Surfacing facts and revealing truths is a never ending quest for us at Veritas. In each episode of our fact finding series, we go on the ground and to speak with industry professionals in an unscripted, candid, live, video format to discover how we can make better investment decisions. In this series, and with everything we do, we believe the facts empower investors and that better information leads to better investment decisions. By way of background, my name is Anthony Schulpati, and I'm the president and CEO of Veritas, which is an independent equity research firm based in Toronto, Canada, and I'm proud to say this year celebrated 22 years, 100% employee owned and operated. Just a quick disclaimer, this broadcast is not to be taken as investment advice, and participants or employees of the Veritas group of companies may own securities discussed in this broadcast. While we love all our guests and our moms especially, this session may contain forward-looking statements, investment opinions, and comments that do not agree, that we may not agree with at all. Imagine that. Now, quick comments on Armand. Um, Armand is a longstanding uh, auditor, uh, went to Laurier University, and has, is currently uh, BDO's Canada uh, National Accounting Standards Partner. He leads all matters related to financial reporting and accounting services and leads BDO's accounting advisory team. Also interesting, he provides expert accounting advice on IFRS standards, Canadian accounting standards for private enterprises and nonprofit organizations, and Canadian public sector accounting standards. And on May 1st of next year, uh, he'll be leaving BDO to uh, take on full-time role as the Accounting Standards Board Chair. He was He's currently the interim chair, as uh, we've had Linda on before, before she uh, um, took took her role to be on the International Accounting Standards yes, Board, too. Yes, very big shoes to fill with, uh, with, with replacing Linda. Yeah, it'll be great. So, um, Armin, tell us about yourself. Why... Why did you get into accounting and, and here you are about to take on kind of the lead role of all our standards here in Canada? Um, yeah, I know it's, it's, it's interesting. How did I get into accounting? I, I think I'm going to blame. Blaming blame, is blame, okay. Blame and thank uh, my high school accounting teacher. Okay. Um, St. Mary's College, Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Uh, Mr. Petula. Uh, staff, students, we all call them slick. <laughs> and uh, he just, he made a high school accounting fun and, uh, and, and, and interesting. And, 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 you know, so I had that as a base for grade 11 and, and OAC accounting, OAC maybe dating myself a little bit for, for people who don't remember grade 13. Um, and then went to Laurier, had amazing profs there too, that I remember Dr. Banks, Dr. Teal. And, and when I think about, you know, why did I become an accountant? I, I think it's it's about those teachers, those 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 people that you know have a really big impact on on someone's lives, and 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 they make the topic interesting, and they make you want to explore more, and and get involved in it. So I just I just gotta throw out to some great teachers. Some shout outs. Way. Yeah, it's all about who inspires you, and so that pushed you to get into accounting. Obviously, you took the you progressed more and more senior roles at BDO. Um, and now you took on the, the to become chair of the accounting yes. standards board. So, so why that move? You, you know, it's, it's it's interesting. I was I was thinking about this, and <laughs> you know how do how do you get into standard setting? And and for me, it it it, it probably started. I, I spent uh, after passing my UFI, I, I ended up spending four and a half years with Ernst and Young in Bermuda, okay. and um, worked when, when I was there was uh, working with the hedge fund industry. And I got to see some really interesting stuff. So this is late 90s, early 2000s, you know, when not everybody and their brother was a hedge fund manager, right? Mm -hmm. When it was, you know, I was dealing with, you know, some of the investment fund managers that we've been dealing with, Michael Steinhardt, Monroe Trout, some of oh, these, yes. these are like the, you know, these are kind of the, 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 the pioneers, the pioneers of, yep. of hedge funds. And they were doing weird, interesting things and, and, and what I found is, you know, to get the accounting right, I actually had to understand what the heck they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that really got me into the technical side of accounting, the accounting research. And, and I really liked it. And but, but what I find interesting about that is, is I didn't start liking it because I wanted to memorize handbook paragraphs. 
I, I got into it because I wanted to understand the transactions. I wanted to understand what they were doing and digging into the accounting let me do that. Um, then moved back to Canada, went back to BDO, BDO in Sault Ste. Marie. And um, I was there for a, for a few years and an opportunity came up with our national office and our technical team. Yep. And I was like, I, I like the technical accounting. So I decided to, to take that opportunity. And that led to being on committees of the accounting standards board that then led to an accounting standards board uh, position as a volunteer member. And the things that I like about technical accounting, I really liked about the accounting standards board. Again, it's not about now writing paragraphs. It's about thinking about the businesses. You know, I think about as, as a board member, you know, dealing with insurance, mm -hmm. dealing with agriculture. Like we, when we were writing our private enterprise center for agriculture, I had no uh, comprehension of how complicated and interesting the agriculture industry is. But I got to learn that as a standard setter, mm -hmm. um, you know, related to agriculture, cannabis, yes. uh, and, and now crypto and insurance. So you get this exposure to all these different businesses and that's what's interesting. That that's that's what gets me going. And yeah, you know, so when the opportunity came up to to put my name in the hat for for chair of the board, I I, I just thought it was the natural evolution of of what I've been doing for the past number of years. Excellent. Well, I have very fond memories of when I was on the board too. Um, and and it's interesting how what you what you've said is something that we've uh, said many times as well is that accounting is the language of business in essence. Yes. And when you understand the accounting, you understand the business. Yes. And that's what needs to drive you to get excited about wanting to learn more. Yes. Um, anyway, let's let's delve into a couple of things here, because one, one thing I want to make clear, you, you mentioned is not necessarily writing the standards, because in Canada, we're no longer writing the international standards. We rely for public companies. We're relying on the International Accounting Standards Board to write the standards. So where does the Canadian Accounting Standards Board fit in from a global perspective on standard setting? Yeah, and I, I think when, when I think about this, I like to start off by talking about what we don't do. Okay. We don't just rubber stamp international accounting standards. Good. Um, there is you know, a long process of, of influence, of doing research. Before a, you know, a, a new standard is even a project on the agenda of the International Accounting Standards Board, we would be talking to staff. We would be talking to other board members of the, of the IASB. Uh, doing research to help support where they're going to go. So we're going to have, hopefully within this year, a, a rate regulated standard. Yeah. That rate regulated standard is really important to us in Canada. Really, really important to us in Canada. And we've been working on that since I was on the board in yes, 2011. You know yes, that. I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> when and, we first transitioned yes. to IFRS. Anyway, keep yeah, going. And, but, but I think when I, when I look at what, what we did as a board, there was research. There, we did a research paper, the accounting standards board. That research paper provided evidence to the board that having information about rate regulation, the financial statements is important for capital allocation decisions. Mm -hmm. Doing that research is what is one of the key steps that led to, um, led to this eventual standard. So, you know, it, it takes time, um, but, that, but that's, that's what I, you know, I think that's why I say that's what we don't do is rub, just rubber stamp. We were along the ride for rate regulated for a long, long time to get there. Maybe it takes too long in, in yes. many people's opinion, um, but it gets there. And then even, you know, tonight I'm hopping on a plane. We're going to London. Uh, we're members of the Accounting Standards Advisory Forum, the Canadian Board, you know, and that's an opportunity for us to provide input on current projects. So although we don't set the standard, we endorse them once, yes. once they're set in Canada, and we do a significant amount of influence before the ISB even finalizes their standards. Interesting. So now as you're, as you're going to take on the role of uh, being chair, what are your goals? Um, well, you know, we have a, as a board, we have our strategic plan. Um, yeah. I'm very committed to that plan. Um, I was vice chair when we were writing that plan. And 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 I'm, I'm and I and I, th I think it's focused on the right thing, relevance. 
our, you know, when I, when I look at what we do at the accounting standards board and what my, my personal goal is, whatever I'm doing, that it's, that it's relevant. I don't want to be doing something just for the, the sake of doing something. And when we talk about relevance, I think for, for, the, for this group, for your audience, for yourself as uh, investment analysts, it's, is it, are you getting relevant information from the standards? Yes. So that's, you know, that's something we're very focused on. But I'm also focused a little bit beyond that in that are people using our standards? And when we look at Canada, and yes, we have our public markets, but we also have the private markets and private companies and, yes. and other users, whether it's financial institutions, banks, and many banks don't require companies to, to have gaps financial statements at the smaller end, right? Yeah. That begs the question, why? Is that's our, what's written into their loan documents, you mean? What's yeah, written into their loan documents, right? They might only need a notice to read or a compilation versus gap financials. And you know, so so that for me that begs the question: why is, is our standards, what we're doing, not relevant to the, the lending to decision? The lending decision, now. right? So yeah, and 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 maybe it's a, a certain size and maybe it's asset backed and they're taking security and all they care about is what the, the real estate's worth. But we need to answer that question as to why companies aren't using the standards, the standards we write. And, if, and, and so, so when I think of relevance, it's the relevance of the information that's in the financial statements, but it's also the relevance of the standards and our people using them. And I know, you know, even when we talk about the standards that are issued and, and for the public companies, I know the topic close to your heart is, yes. is non-GAAP. And yes. again, that's, that's all about relevance as well. Why are, why are companies using non-GAAP? Is that, is that because you know, they want to tell a different story that maybe we don't agree with, or is the standard not providing investors with relevant information? So the answering these types of questions is, is really my goal when I think about relevance. Let, let's unpack that a little bit. I know, obviously, uh, you know, this is a, this is an issue been near and dear to my heart, uh, everything to do with non-GAAP. We've gone a long way. Uh, Kudos to the Canadian standard setters here uh, on the regulatory st standpoint from security side have implemented a new stand now a regulation, which is which I think is 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 excellent. Um, and now um, there's been I know at the accounting standards level uh, on the international side there's there's thought that a non GAAP type number will make its way onto the income statement. Maybe you could talk us through yeah. a little bit about that, what that means and what you think about it. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of things um, they're doing. So there, there is a project looking at primary financial statements, yep. you know, primarily focused on the income statement, statement of comprehensive income, and you know, uh, defining some of the subtotals that are used. So defining operating income. Yep. That's a, you know, the fact that operating income wasn't defined is a, was problematic. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and defining, you know, getting companies away from, you know, income before the undernoted. Right. You know, so, so that that's important. The other thing in their proposal is they'll refer to management performance measures. Yeah. MPMs. Yeah. Which is a subset of non-GAAP. It's not all of non-GAAP, but a subset of non-GAAP. And basically, um, you know, and some in Canada might be saying, well, isn't disclosure of these information isn't already covered by securities regulation, but internationally accounting standards are applied by companies and countries that don't have the rigor that our uh, securities regulation has. And what those requirements will, will be is to disclose information on these management performance measures in the financial statements, reconcile them to the nearest gap number, mm -hmm. explain why this is even relevant information um, to, you know, why the company feels this is relevant information. So, and, and, and then the calculations, they're subject to the rigor of audit. They're subject to the rigor of comparability. So if you change it one year and, mm -hmm. you know, you have, you know, this adjustment one year and you, know, you take that adjustment out the next year because last year it was negative, this year it's positive. Well, now you're going to have to explain that change sure. in the notes. So I, I, I do think, you know, the, the IASB is acknowledging People use non-GAAP measures, and they're they're trying to um, provide more information around that so that investors have better information. But isn't one of the issues with this is you know what one company determines to be an MPM is different than what another company determines to be an MPM, and 
doesn't that then create more of the because we don't have comparability still yeah and it still becomes what management wants and yes. now you know the auditor doesn't really have a standard to say okay this is how you calculate you know cost the what goes into inventory for example yeah. and therefore i know what's going to therefore go into cost of sales as a matter of, because of that yeah. the, the required the accounting standards this one is kind of going to be a little bit more uh, yeah, there's still going to be inconsistency from company to company, but at least the reconciliations will be there. Uh, and those reconciliations will be audited. So you as an investor can then look at it and say, okay, well, this company did X, this company did Y. Right. And, and I can equalize them. Okay. So a little bit more, a little bit more transparency. And exactly. Clarity. Exactly. Um, Okay, cool. It, maybe we could focus now on, on some key areas that you think investors should be paying attention to uh, most in the current financial reporting. Yeah, so a, a couple of things. I, I, I have to talk about sustainability. I, I, you know, it's, it's, the, sure. it's outside of the financial, you know, I, th I think when people think about sustainability uh, and the standards that the ISSB, uh, the International Sustainability Standards Board is issuing, uh, the regulations that, you know, OSFI, the CSA, the SEC, the European Commission are all putting out, they think about that as outside of the financial statements. And it is outside of the financial statements. What I think is important for in, in investors is, is there a consistent narrative? Is what a company is saying in their sustainability report mm -hmm. consistent with some of the judgments and estimates and disclosures they're making in the financial statements? And, and so, so, I, so I really think that, and the IASB has a project to- They, they to, put together a sustainability board. Board, yes. But then the, and they're the, going to put out, put out standards. They're going to put out standards, but then there's a project at the accounting, at the accounting board yes. to, to look at how climate risk, how these things tie into the financial statements. Because I think it's important that, you know, I, I think financial statements are the most important thing in the world, right? I'm an account, I, I, I I'm think accountant, so too. but they're one piece of information yes. investors use. Yes. And as an investor, you want to make sure uh, that that information is consistent. And they're not saying, you know, one thing in one and the other thing in something else in the other. Like the, the example I use, really, really simple example. Sure. Company in a high carbon uh, industry says they're going to be net zero in by 2030. Okay. So that's what? Eight, eight years. Eight years, seven years seven away. Years away yeah. um, and then you look at their capital assets or property plant equipment and you see those those uh, carbon producing assets and they have 20 years of useful life left. Mm -hmm. One of those two things can't be right. And, and, and that's that, and, and hopefully that inconsistency doesn't continue. But I think right now there is a little bit of inconsistency in what companies are saying in versus what they're, they have in their financial statements. And that's a really simple example, useful life of property plant equipment. But that, that is one of the things where I think, you know, investors, auditors, preparers need to make sure that, that there's consistency in what a company is telling them. But the key is also, what, do, what are you looking for as an investor? That 20 year life of that reserve or whatever may actually be excellent for your investment decision. Yes. But if you're investing in this company because it's, it's a it scores very highly on your sustainability metrics. Maybe that's not exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, and 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 to me, that's that's the question. If they're saying they're going to be net zero by twenty thirty, but they have it on on the useful life for twenty years, one of those two things is wrong. Yes, right. So if I'm the one focused on ESG and it's really twenty years, I'm making a bad decision. If I'm focusing on the cash flows from from that uh, oil reserve yes. for the next twenty years. Uh, but they're not going to be doing anything with it. It's going to be a stranded asset in, in eight years. Well, I'm making a bad decision there. So it's it, it the, the lack of consistency uh, it could be a problem. Good. What other areas are key that the investors should pay attention uh, to? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna politely say new asset classes. Sure. Um, you can also say think I'm saying crypto. Why not? <laughs> but but I, I do think new asset classes are broader than crypto. I, I uh, think it's new businesses. It's new the same thing as when when uh, when um, 
uh, cannabis came out. Yes. And all of a sudden, people were uh, blindsided. I was, I mean, I knew, but if you weren't an accountant, this concept of biological assets yes. was foreign. Uh, anyway, well, yeah, tell it, us. definitely. Well, I think anytime you have a new business, a new asset class, uh, whether it's crypto, whether it's actually back to the whole sustainability issue and some of the carbon credits, whether they're reduction credits right. or, or otherwise, you know, accounting standard setting takes time. Yeah. And that it takes time so we get get it right. But business is moving faster than standard setting. Yeah. So as users of financial statements, you have to be aware of that because that's going to lead to inconsistency in how companies are accounting for, for these new businesses, these new asset classes. Um, it They might be making analogies to standards which don't necessarily uh, reflect the economics. And, 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 and so with the pace of change, and, there, and, and things are changing at a yeah. ridiculously rapid pace, um, being aware of that aspect, the fact that new businesses, new asset classes are emerging and, and they're going to constantly emerge. It's, this is not slowing down. No. That there will be a period where there's diversity in the financial reporting, where maybe it's not reflecting the economics of what's actually happening. So maybe we can at least touch on something that's obviously just yes. happened right now. Um, we have the whole FTX fiasco. Um, we have two auditors that were involved um, neither of which I'd heard of, and I don't. I'm not sure that you had. One was our Armanio, and 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 they're uh, auditing the FTX US uh, operation, and then Prager Metis uh, is auditing the FTX trading. And you know, sometimes investment doesn't have to be complex. The level of research you just read that pra Prager Metis is a leading international advisory and accounting firm is the first CPA firm to officially open its metaverse headquarters in the metaverse platform Decentraland. And the metaverse address coordinates are 19,144 in Decentraland. I'm not sure, what, what do we do with that? <laughs> you, know, I, 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 you know, I don't, you know, as an auditor, I don't wanna be critical of other auditors, no. but, but there is, you know, who are they? You know, what is their history? Um, FTX is a thirty billion dollar company, or, or sure. uh, you know, at one point, at, yeah, at, one, one, time. One, at one point, um, I, I, you know, I don't know anything about them. I don't right. know their resources. I don't, you know, auditing a thirty billion dollar company takes resources. Yes, um, auditing in the crypto environment is yes. very, very difficult, just because of the technology involved. So the resources you need to audit in that space. Are, are very intense. So this company on the metaverse in Decentraland, which makes me laugh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it just, it that begs the question. But, but it begs it, yeah. two questions, no, because the world is moving here. Yes. Zuckerberg tells us we're moving here. The, 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 if, if we took, out a few, took off a few years and a little gray hair, we may get to a point to say that, you know what, look, this metaverse is real. I'm going to live in an alternate reality. So, I mean, you think I'm crazy, but it, it, it's, it's, it's happening. Yes. And so, does that mean, what does that mean that, you know, as an investor, and I'm looking and I'm trying to understand, okay, how do you value these crypto assets? What are these assets on the balance sheet? What's going through the income statement? What sort of things, what, what, do, you, what do you think, that, what can you unpack there? Um, yeah, like, I, I, I do think, you know, the metaverse, uh, blockchain technology. Yes. It's not going away. No. You know, regardless of what happens to crypto, whatever happens to the FTXs of the world. Correct. You know, it, it's like the early 2000s when the dot com bubble, right? If yeah. not, if, if, if all those dot coms didn't exist. Yes. You know, and fail. Yes. Would we be where we are today? Probably not. Probably not. Right. So, so I think, I think we have to look at this as this is where we're going. Mm -hmm. But as we go there, there's going to be a lot of failures along the way. And there are going to be some companies that emerge uh, as, you know, that are going to be part of our life 
uh, you know, who, who thought this online bookstore, Amazon, back in whatever year it launched, would be our everything, where we buy everything now, right? That was, his, that was if you read those original uh, shareholder letters, he was talking about that, that we want to be the everything store. Yeah, so, but, you know, so, so I don't know, like, obviously it's not FTX. FTX no. is looking more like Enron than looking like Amazon. That's for sure. um, but there is going to be a company operating in the blockchain, operating in the metaverse that is going to, to be that. So, so it's a reality. So from a standard setting perspective, what can we do? You know, I, I, I think that this is the, this is the challenging uh, aspect of it. Um, it's new, yeah. um, you know, standard setters. We, we are what we are, you know, we, we know what we know. Yes. Um, you know, myself, I, I, I've never audited a, a crypto company before, you know, as I move into yeah. my, this accounting set, standard setter world. Um, you know, so it, it, it let's, let's, you know, we're being very open, transparent yeah. here. Let's, it, it scares us a little bit, like there sure. are, you know, and and I've heard people, you know, say, well, if we set standards uh, in this space, we're legitimizing it. Um, I, I don't know if I agree with that comment. It's, well, the it's moment there. that the regulator has allowed it, the securities regulator has allowed it to trade on an exchange, the, the securities of said organization or said um, that all all of a sudden opens that company's. To individuals and institutions yes. buying their securities. Yes. So, ex regardless of what I think about crypto, right? It, it's irrelevant. My my thoughts on crypto are completely irrelevant right. to the buy. People are transacting in it. People are holding it. Right. People are losing money and making money and yeah. making money. But but I think you know I, I think the one thing and if, if we can take any positives from these failures, yes, is the failures might actually get the attention of regulators, of standard setters to basically say, maybe we were a little late to the game, but we're, we're gonna get there now. And I think that's one of the things I, I, I believe we have to do a better job of. And, and I push all the time for users to get involved. You know, I, I was chair of the user advisory committee here. Now I'm on the CMAC in, in, in at the international level. If the users don't get involved and say, hey, we need an answer to how to value this crypto asset, and how do I read this revenue? What exactly is that costs, et cetera? If there's not that push, then the standard setters won't necessarily know that that's a key but hot button to deal yes. with, right? Exactly. And so um, I, I really make that you know empathetic uh, push here that that's what that's what we need. We need more voices to say, hey, we need a standard here because what's happening is the large firms are just shying away. They, they you, you, this is not being these companies are not being audited by the big four. Yeah, well, and, and you know what, I I get it. Um, you know, it, it's the early days. There's like when I, you know, when it I say also, there's going to be failures, that means there's going to be litigation, and there's going right. to be all sorts of things that you know, any not just audit firms, any company wants that doesn't want, no one wants to be involved in litigation, right? That's so right. We, we we there's a risk management aspect to it. If there, anyone has a question, just scroll down to the bottom of your screen and type it in and I'll make sure that uh, Armand addresses it. Um, I know that there's a few uh, important new sections coming. I just wanna wrap up with, yeah. with some of those, um, especially you mentioned insurance. Uh, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about what's happening with IFRS 17 yes. and uh, what investors should pay attention to here. Yes, yeah, so the IFRS 17 becomes effective January 1, 2023. So you know, Q1 2023 is going to be a big quarter, yep. but I actually think year end 2022 is going to be critically important because Boy. the insurers have done their work, right? Yep. And they they are going to, at least I, I, I hope they're going to, and I, I, I believe- They've already, they, they've already given, yeah. given some guidance. Yeah, given some guidance, but I think, I think there's going to be even more guidance around year end yep. of what the impact is so when when investors are looking at an insurance company looking at the, the year end 22 2022 statements it's not just going to be looking about what happened it's also going to be okay what does this do to the numbers going forward so again paying attention to that change before the change is effective mm -hmm. is going to be critically important 
Good. And the other, I think, hot button issue that's obviously coming here now as we enter into a softer economic environment is all IFRS 9. And we yes. moved from IFRS 39. We're now on this new IFRS 9. Um, maybe you could just walk us through some of the things that you think as, as, as you know, because obviously banks are fundamental to our uh, investing world here in Canada um, and credit losses are starting to rise. Yes. What should investors hone in on and think about? Really focus on the disclosures around what they built into their estimates related sure. to expected credit loss. Um, you know, we're coming out of a period, like even with COVID, right? Mm -hmm. We're coming out of a period of really stable economic growth, right? Even, you know, the blip of COVID was like, what, Q Q1 2020. <laughs> and then, you know, then with all the government incentives and economic everything. Economic boom practice. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Um, but we're, we haven't been since 2008 in an environment um, where housing prices are dropping yep. um, because of in interest rates. Interest rates and inflation are at rates I've never seen in my professional career. Yep. And so as we look at forward-looking information that gets built into the expected credit loss, I really want to know how the financial institutions are building that into their estimates. How are they, how are they incorporating, you know, potential loss in value uh, of, of, of housing? How are they building in interest rates going up and companies and, or, and, and individuals struggling with payments? In a couple articles uh, in the Globe recently about REITs yep. um, uh, stopping uh, distributions or stopping redemptions uh, related to the fact that their interest rates are rising and therefore they need that cash that would have regularly been a distribution to pay additional interest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how is all that being incorporated in uh, to expected credit losses is, is, is something I, I think is critically important. Interesting. Um, let's see, we have a, someone's asked us a question, so we'll just hover and uh, get it. Uh, let's just see here. Um, can you read that? No, my. Uh, I we got to fix this. <laughs> where Where are the Canadian and or international boards on developing standards for crypto? As a user and an investor, I don't even know where to start in asking questions. How are the standards board figuring this out? Yes. Yeah, so the International Accounting Standards Board recently did an agenda consultation, and a num you know, and, and they decided in their feedback statement after their agenda consultation that they were not going to add crypto um, or digital assets to their agenda. Uh, I think it's really important though to, to, to read um, exactly what they said. They said, although we're not adding it to our agenda, if evidence emerges um, that there is an issue, yep. we, we will act. Now, I think one of the issues that we have is the ISB is very much focused on the capital markets. Yep. So in Canada, we have a lot of crypto companies that list in Canada. You know, it's, it's you know, 60, speaking with CPAP, this is yeah, an issue. Six, 60 or 70 of them, right? Yeah. But in other jurisdictions, the crypto companies are not public companies. So it's not, it's not. So, so right now it's, it's the, it's us in Canada saying, you know, we have these 70 companies that, that have these issues need a standard. And the ISP is saying, well, we set standards for the globe and no one else is talking to us about this. So maybe we can write our own standard. You know, domestically we could, we could issue a standard for private companies. Yeah, that, that could be something that we consider that, you know, it's not going to help public companies. But you can't write something on the public companies because? Well, the, the Can Canadian Securities Administrator uh, uh, legislation uh, says you need to follow IFRS as issued by the IASB. Right. So we really need the, you know, for something to happen on the public company market, we need the IASB to act. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, we're, we're continuing to do research at the Accounting Standards Board. Um, you know, we're, to 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 provide evidence that there is something to be done, uh, it's a slow process though. I know, and I think, but the problem is that the as you said before, business is moving faster. Yes, and we got to keep up. And 
we I think I know that in the stand the accounting standards there is leeway that says there if there is no standard for this you can use other uh, yeah. uh, other official like other standards and or practices yeah and and and, and you know the one thing the IASB did did do or not the the IFRA the IFRS interpretations yes. committee. They issued, and so the way the IFRIC works is if you have a question, you submit a question to the IFRIC yep. and they have to address it. Yes. And they either address it by doing an interpretation or address it by issuing an agenda decision. Yes. And they did issue an agenda decision related to crypto holdings. And they basically said, it's an intent, it's either, it's an intangible asset, or if you're holding it as a, as a kind of a broker dealer, it's inventory. And yeah, so so by with that IFRIC agenda decision out there, those are right now, those are the two standards you look at, intangible assets or inventory. or inventory. And some of the issues that are that are arising related to crypto, you know, it's you know, intangibles wasn't built, the intangible asset standard wasn't built to deal with crypto, right? You know, the inventory standard wasn't built to deal with it, but now we're we're kind of handcuffed, you know, as pre preparers, auditors are handcuffed. Well, no, it's, this is what the IFRIC said. So it's either third, you know, IAS 38 intangibles or I IAS 2 um, inventory. Yeah. Has, has FASB said anything about this? Uh, the FASB has a project uh, ongoing right now to do some, uh, to, to deal with crypto holding. So we were watching that very, very closely. Um, we're we're starting to hear some rumblings that the SEC is starting to get some get some concerned about this as well. So all of these things help. The more other jurisdictions other than Canada um, start making some noise about this, the the more likely the IASB is to to act. But here's something else for us to think about. You said, and 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 I I know this is true. Uh, in other jurisdictions, like in parts of Europe, there isn't the same number of concentration of these type of crypto companies as there is in Canada. So why is that the case? Well, not that there's not as many crypto companies. Okay. They just stay private. I see. Can't, like, so, and, and whether they're private or not, FTX was private. Yes. Lots of people lost money, you know, uh, and, you know, there was, you know, a large pension fund in Canada that, That's right. that lost money. Um, so the fact that they're private, you know, I, I come from BDO. BDO is my background. Yes, you do, do a lot we, of private. We do public companies, but our primary market is private companies. I, I don't think we should ignore private companies, right? Correct. Uh, and and I think, you know, so the fact that it's not hitting the capital markets shouldn't be something that, in my opinion, my personal opinion, that that slows us down on doing something related to this. Totally agreed. Um, last couple. I'm just going to. Uh, launch our uh, uh, poll here so everybody can tell us uh, what a great job you've done, Armand. And then I have a couple of uh, last parting questions as okay. we like to ask all our guests. Your favorite podcast. Okay, favorite podcast. I am a huge Saturday Night Live fan. Okay. It's been a Sunday morning tradition of mine. Uh, from the time recording on my parents' Betamax. You know. uh, there is a fabulous podcast for any Saturday Night Live fans called Fly on the Wall. Dana Carvey and David Spade, uh, they interview uh, former cast members, writers, hosts, musical guests, really gets inside baseball into Saturday Night Live. I absolutely love it. Good. That's a, that's a nice brain uh, sort of release. And, yes. Uh, and your favorite book. Okay. Now I'm going to sound like a real nerd. That's okay. Real, real nerd. Um, there is a book. It's uh, by an author, Atul Gawande. Uh, I, I found out about this book many years ago, watching uh, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. It's called The Checklist Manifesto. Okay. Uh, he was talking about it on Jon Stewart. Checklist. I'm an auditor. I love checklists. Correct. Uh, great book about how checklists, if designed properly, can really improve quality uh, of, of anything. There's stories about how it's used in the medical profession, yes. airlines, engineering firms. And, and one of my favorite stories from the book is, uh, and they've done research, they, they implement checklists, they follow it and say what's working, what's not. And, and, and this is one I, I live by, is in the, in the medical, in, 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 in OR. Yep. 
doctors and nurses. They found that by having on a checklist, everybody introduced themselves. Yes. Led to better quality outcomes of surgeries because it created a rapport between the team working yes. together. And, and I, I just think that rapport is critical for any time you're trying to solve any problem, whether it's surgery or an accounting issue. Well, you know, when, you're, when, when we set up boards and we set up a, a meeting for committees, we always have, every, I think, always have everybody yes. introduce themselves, exactly. give a quick commercial message about them yep. themselves. So, uh, Armand, that was wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you no, for your time. This is a lot time. of fun. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, tuning in again.